questions we might ask ourselves at the end of a season, like, do we feel like we have some blind spots and what are those? So we really have time to dive into some of the decision making. So we talked about a pre-bias or a mindset, some of these mountain guide and the avalanche educator techniques that we use and try to share those with the general public. A little bit about me. I'm an internationally licensed mountain guide in the United States. I did my studies. I live in Chamonix, France for the time being. We've been here a couple of years and I don't know, we'll see, maybe hang around another year. And I'm an ARI course leader. So ARI is the American Institute of Avalanche Research and Education, founded in the mid 90s, way back when, when the US was getting into the international guiding community. And I lead the uh, recreational level one and recreational two courses for them. I don't teach the professional courses. And I have a little guide service that a friend and I founded in the United States, but he and I both moved to Europe. And one of my side hustles is journalism and writing. So I've done a couple books, the Mountain Guide Manual and the Ski Guide Manual. I'm sure you all have three and four copies of each, right? I started guiding roughly 2004. It was a good time. And, uh, but we're here to talk about skiing. So I hope all of you got turns like that um, this winter. That's my buddy Ben killing it at Weimar Lodge in uh, Canada a couple of years ago. That was on an, an airy level two. And it was a challenging year, almost nationwide in the United States. But over here as well, we had a weird period with some really bad avalanche conditions, things like that. And uh, it's been a sort of a showstopper year in the States too, with persistent problems all over uh, the American West and whatnot. So anyway, I hope you got some good turns. That's skiing up in Canada. Here's another shot of uh, skiing up by uh, Sunrise Lodge. That big peak in the distance on the right is Mount Iconoclast, which you can ski in a very big day from Sorcerer Lodge. I have not had the opportunity to ski off that thing yet, but uh, someday we'll see. I'm, I'm hoping, you know. So anyway, there's another glimpse of uh, Canada, that was a phenomenal week we had right there, which actually the 57 hours founders, Carmen and uh, two of the founders, Carmen and Victor were on this trip. That was a pretty fun week. It was really cold. We had great skiing. So today we are going to talk about this Airy 2 course or courses that I'm going to teach in Canada with some very capable co-instructors and uh, Weimar Lodge. And I'll uh, give you some photos of that place and talk about why it's such a good venue. And then we'll talk about this end of the season debrief that I hope everybody does. I've certainly been thinking about how my season went. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Airy Level 2 and what it entails. Are you ready for it? Are you interested in it? What is it for? What are you going to learn? Things like that. And uh, give you really specific info on those trips in Canada right at the end. And then we'll have some time for questions as well. So Weimar Lodge is this little gem of a place just south of Nelson, British Columbia. And I discovered it a couple years ago when I finally mustered up the courage to ask a mentor of mine, hey, should we teach a level two together? And this gentleman, there you can see Weimar Lodge on the map right there. So it's in sort of south central British Columbia. And the nearest airport for most Americans is actually Spokane, Washington. So if, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the map there, but Spokane's right about down there. You fly in there drive about three hours up to uh, Weimar Lodge, just south of Nelson. Nelson's a fun little town. But um, I found Weimar Lodge when I was um, calling my buddy who's in the middle there in that orange jacket with the goggles on his head standing up. That's Colin Zacharias. He's become a good friend, but he's a longtime mentor of mine. And uh, he's sort of a legend in the heli ski guiding industry and, and mountain guiding and things. And I had been studying under him for He's more, you know, about a decade. And I finally said, hey, Colin, we should maybe teach a level two someday. And uh, Colin had just come up with a new curriculum for Airy for the level ones and twos. So he uh, generously agreed to teach with me. So I learned a ton and uh, been going back up to uh, Canada with him since 2018. So that's the whole crew flying out of Weimar Lodge the first year we did it. A whole bunch of really fun, intrepid skiers right there. We had a blast. And uh, here's another one of those Lodge, as I was describing, this is not Weimar, this is Sunrise again, but that's Carmen, one of the founders of 57 Hours, so I threw a photo of her in, and, um, but you can see the lodges up there are just awesome, and the, uh, the snowpack in the Kootenays, where Weimar Lodge is generally really generous, so, you know, you'll have a couple, three meters, four meters, and a really good year of snow on the ground. It's just been a phenomenal experience getting to go skiing up there, so, and those are the kind of turns we get. So uh, that's uh, my friend Cooper. Uh, that was a phenomenal week. We didn't cross tracks all week. We just had the whole place to ourselves and it just snowed. You know, we got like three storms came through that week. It was really a cool week. We had a great time. So that was a, a fun and memorable week. We got a bunch of good photos out of that week. It was cool.
Oh, yeah. And this was just a stellar week. I mean, you can see the terrain in there. You know, like I said, we had the whole place to ourselves. It was so fun. So here's the front porch on Weimar Lodge. Since I took this photo, my buddy Trevor, who owns the lodge, has actually wrecked this porch and built a bigger one. So there's a new barbecue out there now. But that's looking off the front porch and out of the terrain. And you can see just, this is in what they call the Kootenays, which is in a little sub range of the Selkirks up there in Canada. It's a unique little swath of the mountains there. You've probably heard of Fernie, Red Mountain. Those are not too far away as well. You get almost coastal amounts of snow, but it's interior enough that it dries out. So it's really, really just awesome skiing. Not quite as um, dry as the Rockies. You don't get as many persistent weak layers, but you get a ton more snow like the coast. And it's somewhere in between in terms of density. And so, uh, you, man, the skiing is just awesome. And it's really well known for good tree skiing. So you can see back there on South Seaman Peak, that's called up in the upper right. Right off the porch of the lodge, there's another view of the lodge. You can get four aspects of skiing in less than a half an hour. So it makes a really great venue for an avalanche course. It's non-glaciated, so we don't have to worry about crevasses, which is pretty nice. And you got all four aspects right around the lodge, and it tends to snow a bunch. So... That was uh, one of the reasons we went there. But you can see the lodge is this old, it used to be a cat skiing operation. And then my buddy uh, Trevor bought it and he has been slowly upgrading it and, uh, you know, replacing drywall and redoing the wiring and all that. So every time we go back up there, it's, uh, we're always excited to see what he's um, done over the summer. He goes up there with his buddies and pounds nails and does this and that. So you can see it's a pretty big structure. Here's another view of it at night. I have two friends who are Professional photographers come on different years and they shot some really nice photos. But you can see it's an enormous structure, which makes it ideal for an avalanche course uh, because we all have room to spread out, show slides. There's a huge dining room table. There's, you know, a couple couches in there and then a big upstairs with rooms for two and three people. So it just makes it a great venue for avalanche courses. But, you know, it's fun being up there. We helicopter in, you get the whole tenure to yourselves, and it's just quiet at night. You can see the stars up there. It's absolutely fantastic. There's a little shot of the interior. This is a year you can see you replaced the drywall down in the dining room. So you, had, you know, busted out all the old drywall and rehung new uh, sheetrock there. But that's us having a little guide meeting in the morning. We get up really early and get the weather and get the avalanche bullets in and do all this. And then we pour over map and uh, do this kind of thing. But you can see... There's a, that's about a quarter of the dining room table and the couches in the, in the foreground there. So it just makes it a fantastic venue to spread out, hang out, relax. You can go up and go to bed, you know, and, and get to sleep if other people are downstairs. Like I said, we fly in and when we fly in, we bring a chef, this gentleman on the left there, Fabian, he was our chef last year, two years ago now, I guess, a year and a half ago. We didn't, we didn't get to go this most recent winter, but Fabian was just an awesome chef. He's actually from Chamonix where I live now. And uh, he lives in Revelstoke, married a Canadian woman. He was a, a gas to hang out with and they had fun stories. And he was a really good chef. But you can see that's the kitchen right there. It's a giant kitchen. You can cook for 15, 18 people. It's great. And there's my buddy Connie sitting next to the stove. She was psyched after a big day of touring. We had a great time with her as well. She owns a gym down in Boulder, Colorado called uh, the Alpine Training Center. She came up with a buddy of hers from Jackson. It was a good time. So that's a little bit about Canada skiing and Weimar Lodge and all that fun stuff we do up there. So let's think about the seasons we just had and survived, right? So we talk about getting to the end of the year and then we do a debrief at the end of the season. So just like we go out for a day of skiing, we do a, a debrief at the end of our day of skiing and uh, we'll do a, an end of season debrief as mountain guides. We think about what went well, what didn't go so well. And so obviously this year there was grouchy avalanche conditions all over the Western U.S. And I think when we, you know, revisit this season, I think what's really going to shake out is less COVID and, you know, new backcountry users and more that we had persistent weak layers. Just about everywhere had a period this year that had an angry snowpack. The Tetons, Colorado as usual, but even Utah and uh, Washington, obviously having more people out there is an issue as well. But so we survived the season. And now we'll start talking about a debrief, right? This is another photo of Weimar Lodge right there, actually, as we're going up a, one of the peaks there to ski. As we do a debrief, often on a day debrief or a season debrief, we ask, you know, similar questions. How did it go overall? Did you have a good year, a bad year, mixed bag? You know, most of us end the season with a mixed bag. You have a couple of days where you blow it, a couple of days where you nail it. The thing we try to remind folks, too, is what went right. We love to celebrate the things we did well, but we also ask ourselves, could it have been a better day? Could it have gone right while we're out touring? 
And uh, so, you know, if you were skiing boot top pow and your buddies get back to the trailhead and say they were skiing knee deep pow, well, maybe they were skiing in a slightly, uh, you know, better aspect or something like that. So over the season, we've got to ask ourselves these same questions. Obviously, what went wrong? Those are always learning experiences. If you had a uh, four day of skiing, you got in an argument with your teammates or God forbid you had an avalanche, something like that. Those are obvious things that went wrong. Those are pretty easy to identify. The things that are slightly less obvious are these things that almost went wrong, the near misses. And on some days we get really good skiing, but it might have been the wrong call if we went out in the wrong aspect or we just got lucky and got away with something. You know, those are the days that are a little more difficult to identify as a potential near miss or when something went wrong. We try to focus on those as much as, uh, as anything else and really think about did we have a good process that day? Were we diligent? Did we tour plan well? How did our team work together? Things like that. You might, you know, have gotten good skiing, but if you look back and say, man, we really didn't put a lot of thought into where we were skiing that day. Uh, you know, that might be a day you could reevaluate and just say, ah, okay, we could have done a better job that day, even though we got a good turn, something like that. There's my buddy Dylan. That was just last week. That's up to the Col du Belvedere above Chamonix. And then, you know, other questions we might ask ourselves at the end of a season, like, do we feel like we have some blind spots and what are those? Are we absolutely useless with a map and compass? I know I've definitely switched over to using the phone as my main navigation tool, but we want to make sure skills like map and compass don't get rusty or our rescue skills. You know, I luckily have never had to put anybody in a rescue sled and tow him or her to a, you know, a landing zone or a hut or something like that. But if I haven't assembled my rescue sled and put somebody in it in a season, uh, well, maybe I should make some time to do that over the summer. But anything that seems like a blind spot, if your buddies are talking about snowpack tests that you don't understand, or maybe they're talking about tests and it seems like they don't understand them, you know, you could uh, identify those and really think about, okay, so how are we going to address those going into next season? Can we book an avalanche course early next year or a companion rescue course, something like that, or uh, just practice over the summer or things? And, um, you know, thinking about your team as well, were you skiing with the right folks? Were they patient? Were they making smart decisions? And uh, were you making good team decisions? Was it a good vibe between everybody? Those are all great questions to ask. And of course, did you get the goods? Did you get some good skiing? in? So, you know, my buddy Dylan and I on this day, we had a very nice day. You can see tracks above us, they were coming back out. But when we got to the coal, nobody had skied off the other direction. So there was 10 or 15 centimeters of new snow that had not been touched. So that was a, a nice little surprise for us. So we got the goods that day. This year it's been tough to get the goods because the, the chairlifts never open in France. We've been uh, sort of lamenting all the good skiing we missed way up high on the Mont Blanc mass. One of the things too we can take from all of our avalanche, you know, dorking out that we do is trying to use these skills we've developed in our avalanche world and apply them other places like ice climbing, like mountain biking, rock climbing, Parapunting, whatever it is, because what we're doing when we, uh, you know, get better at managing avalanche hazard, it we're managing a risk, right? So obviously that's Mikey Arnold right there leading a, a really steep pitch of ice up in Switzerland this winter. You know, that's a pretty real ice climb right there. That was hard, certainly for me. And um, you know, we got to think about: is this worth it? How are we managing the risk? You know, ask ourselves questions like this, right? So we debrief our days, and you can do this mountain biking, you can do it fly fishing, you can do it you know, almost any activity and just ask yourself, when was I in danger? Could I have done something different? Could I have improved on the day? You could ask yourself, if I went back tomorrow and did the exact same ice climb or mountain bike ride or a parapont thing or base jump or whatever you're into, would you do anything differently? And if you did, that's chances are, that's a little thing you identified as, ah, I could have done that better, you know? And I think just about every single day I go out, I think back and I, oh, I could have done this a little differently. I could have stacked my rope more neatly. I knocked a rock down on the Matterhorn last summer. It was not cool. And I kind of was like, oh, yeah, my rope was a little, you know, splayed out next to me when I was lowering a, a client down there. And I, I got my rope kind of around the little rock, things like that, that you remind yourself like, oh, I'm not going to let that happen again. One of the things we, I think we try to coach people in avalanche is just to slow down. Anytime things seem overwhelming, confusing, or uncertain, you just slow down and really back up and try to take a big picture panoramic view and, and ask yourself, are things going my way or whatever? And then another thing we do in avalanche practice is we just try to think in probabilities or think in bets. It's rarely, is it an absolutely clear yes or no decision in avalanche terrain, right? On a 
Extreme danger day, okay, that's a pretty obvious situation. Or on low danger day, well, you're starting to get towards an easier decision, but both of those days are not without um, you know, a bit of uncertainty around them. So we think in those probabilities, right? And so once we're doing that, there's a buddy of mine mountain biking a couple seasons ago. Once we're doing that, we're thinking in probabilities, really we're not thinking so much in, oh, it's safe or unsafe, right? We're thinking of riskier, less risky, safe or less safe, right? This is how I like to try to um, frame anything that's risky, driving on the highway, going trail running after dark, uh, you know, or going skiing on a considerable avalanche, danger day. You're always thinking about the likelihood. How likely is it that I'm going to encounter a problem? So if you're mountain biking, how likely is it that I crash, right? Okay, maybe you're a pretty good mountain biker. But what are the consequences if you crash? Like right here where my buddy's riding in the meadow, well, you might get dirty. You might, you know, find yourself in a patch of wildflowers or something. But around Chamonix, some of the trails are really quite close to cliffs and very, very steep hillsides. So the consequences could be through the roof, right? So even though it's low likelihood, if the consequence is certain death, well, that really changes your sense of what the hazard is, right? And then exposure is pretty easy. Are you exposed to the hazard? Yes or no. So if you're not skiing in avalanche terrain, you're not exposed to the hazard. Makes it pretty easy to avoid it. And then how vulnerable are we to the, to the hazard we're facing? Turns out we're pretty vulnerable to avalanches, right? Uh, but falling off a mountain bike, going 10 miles an hour, okay, you could sprain a wrist or something, but typically we're not in risk of death or anything like this. And that all comes down to what our process is. So this whole thing, how we debrief, how we build a team, how we do all these things, that's our process. And often in the avalanche terrain, we decide what terrain is safe on a certain day or safer and what terrain is absolutely no go. So that's part of our process. So as you start doing this in um, other sports and things like that, maybe you can adapt your avalanche practice a little bit to whatever you're doing out there on two wheels or up in the air or you know, however you're recreating, right? So I mentioned a little bit about, you know, summer homework, right? So it sounds a little weird for our avalanche stuff to get into uh, doing summer, you know, exercises or whatever. So go uh, climb, ride, hike, fly somewhere cool. That's your first assignment I'll give you. We were sick of being cooped up here without the lifts running and it was a rainy week in Chamonix. And so a couple of friends and I went down south. That's on the south coast of France, right next to Marseille. This is a rock climbing place called the Calanx, which was as you can see, just absolutely stellar. It's my buddy Karen sitting there. But, you know, go somewhere cool, challenge yourself, do other cool things outdoors, and try to apply a process that maybe you have incorporated from your avalanche practice, right? And that's one of the things we really try to hammer home in the area too, is applying this repeatable process when we go out into avalanche terrain. And so the nice thing in these Canadian courses we do is they're a week long. So we have, instead of just three days, we have six days, six days of touring, and then you know, a half day on either side flying in and out of the hut. So it gives us a ton of time to really perfect that process and apply it, right? So as we're doing it in the, uh, the summer though, try to apply it to some other stuff and then see if you can get better with your beacon. Obviously we can't go out and do our, you know, shoveling exercises or dig up uh, buried beacons or anything like that in the summer. But what you can do is get a couple beacons together and then you can hide them. I use soccer cones, you know, you just get a whole mess of soccer cones and you hide beacons under a couple of those. You can really start to challenge yourself by finding two and three beacons at a time and really figuring out some of the more subtle features of your um, avalanche transceiver. We can talk a little bit more about how to do that and some ideas for that. But also look ahead at, during the summer, talk to the guys you ski with and your teammates and ask him or her, you know, buddies, or if it's a group, whatever, just say, hey, you know, what are we thinking about next season? You want to do a level two or should we go elsewhere and ski in a different snowpack or just, you know, something that would be fruitful for you and worth your time, right? As far as those transceiver skills I was mentioning, a couple of ideas is to download your owner's manual onto your phone, right? Because then when you're out in the field or at a hut or whatever you're doing traveling, if you can't remember how to switch your beacon into the auto reverb function, for example, all the beacons tend to do these things differently. So get your owner's manual on your phone. If you are if you tour with a couple of folks regularly, get their owner's manuals on your phone too. And that way you can say, oh, this is how you make it the auto revert after one minute instead of four minutes or something like that. Like my Peeps beacon will do that. The BCA beacons, you have to hold the buttons down in a certain way when you turn on the transceiver. Download that owner's manual and then you'll always have that uh, information with you. And then you can really get a hold of all of its features, right? 
marking features or that big picture feature on a VCA beacon or the scan feature on a Peeps beacon, you know, they all work a little bit differently. And so it's really, really tough to keep them all straight. I know I've had, you know, difficulty doing this. So, and then walk through a couple of those complex scenarios, you know, two beacons really close to each other with one far away, stuff like that. And, you know, doing it in the, in the summer, you'll really start to see how your beacon behaves. And then it come winter time when it's actually buried or you go to a beacon park or something like that, or God forbid you ever, ever have to have a real rescue, you're going to be way more uh, comfortable with that beacon in a, in a subtle, you know, kind of nuanced situation, right? And we talked a little bit about blind spots, right? So those can sometimes be hard to identify, right? Part of the, the deal with blind spots is you don't, you don't know you have them necessarily, right? So as you look back, ask your teammates and really review what went well and try to identify some of these things, right? So questions you could ask yourself, what weather conditions produce weak layers, right? Some of these fundamental area one, level one um, reminders and things like that, right? So what kind of weather system would you need to produce surface hoar? What kind of weather would produce near surface facets, things like that. If those questions, you know, are still a little foggy for you, you can certainly read up over the summer. There's a ton of stuff. I'll give you some resources here in a little bit about where to find info on those things. You know, other things to consider, what snowpack test for what avalanche problem? So if you have a buried weak layer that's now 130 centimeters deep because it's been snowing like crazy, what tests are better for deeper weak layers? right? What tests are better if you have a really hard mid-pack above your weak layer? Things like that. If you don't know the answer to those questions off the top of your head, ah, you know, maybe it's worth revisiting some of that stuff over the summer. And so some of the things you can do too are review pit videos, watch them with your buddies, you know, kind of revisit what tests the forecasters are using. Like the Gallatin Center up there in uh, Montana, they do really, really good videos that are generally a minute or a minute and a half long. And they'll show you an ECT, a PST, tell you why they're doing them maybe. Those can be really helpful videos, but you know, ask yourself if you kind of know, why would I use an ECT one day and maybe a PST the next week? What sort of weak layers are, are gonna be easier to track with a PST versus an ECT and why? We'll give you some books to maybe read up on and things like that. But these are the kind of questions you can ask yourself at the end of the year. And now you got all summer to kind of chew on them, you know, revisit your Bruce Tremper book or the Avalanche Handbook. If you guys have seen that, that thing is like a 285 page sleeping pill, but that's got a bunch of good information in there. You know, an obvious jump for a lot of folks is just to consider taking a level two. Some people will consider taking the first level professional course. That's a little more involved to get into. So most recreationalists will try to jump into a level two, right? Some people will look at an area two as like, oh yeah, we're going to get into bigger rat or terrain or whatever, but really, it's really about taking what you learned in your level one and starting to refine it and deepen that skill set. So you don't have to think about this as like, you know, a means to go bigger or take more risk or anything like that. We're really focused on perfecting these skills that you probably already have and then fleshing them out with some new things that will complement those and help you make better observations, reduce uncertainty, gather information more accurately with your team. And another key facet of the area too is trying to go from being a contributing member of a team to, you know, really being a bit of a group leader and how to facilitate in terms of tour planning, in terms of being out there in the field and things like that. So we talk a lot about communication strategies, how to build a team, things like that, different ways to communicate that'll sort of pull out information rather than shut down a conversation, things like that. Then we get into some slightly more subtle concepts that aren't totally fleshed out on the area one, like how to build a seasonal snowpack. You know, depending on where you live, maybe it starts snowing October, November, or something like that. And uh, so we're really tracking the snow and seeing what it's doing uh, while it's sitting on the ground there. Snow may just completely melt off on south aspects, or it could stay high north-facing aspects and turn into depth or later in the season. So this is just the first step on trying to keep a handle on that. And then if you haven't heard the term run atlas, right, you go to some of these lodges in Canada, they'll have a big three-ring binder on the table, and it'll, you know, just have images of all the runs in the tenure. So you can get a look at, oh, that's what that run looks like. Oh, there's cliffs on the side of the run or, oh, the start zone is deeper on the left than the right, you know, things like that. So you can start doing it for your home area that's Berthoud Pass or up at, you know, Mount Rose Highway or Teton Pass or wherever, Snoqualmie, wherever you're skiing, you want to, every time you go out, just try to shoot a few photos. You know, I moved to Chamonix two years ago. And so that first winter and last winter, I was trying to shoot photos everywhere I went, come home, dump them into a folder and just label them real quick. Hey, that's the cold des Autons or something. So that way, if I ever go up there, I can have those photos on my phone 
I can look at them in the field, you know, things like that, and really have a, a much better sense of, oh, what's below me? What's on the left? What's on the right? Where does that, you know, little drainage come in? Things like that. So that can be a really helpful skill to try to develop on the area too. And obviously we get deep, deep, deep into the decision-making. This has been the hot topic with AVI courses the last decade. You know, so we talk, try to talk about what is a pre-bias? How do you de-bias your planning and uh, touring? And, uh, you know, in the ARI field book, there's a whole flow chart that says ride safely, right? That's part of that is making observations, things like that. But part of that is de-biasing. There's de bias strategies that we use in the field so we don't end up succumbing to whatever, confirmation bias or outcome bias or things like this. So we talk a lot of it about that and give a bunch of reading material before we get into the area too on uh, pre-biasing, de-biasing strategies, things like that. And then of course, team building, that's a tough one, right? You've all gone to a new venue or something like that. It's hard to find good new touring parts. Some people you jive with in the field, some people you don't. So we talk a little bit about how to, what you're looking for in a teammate and how to, you know, sort of nurture that good team vibe when you're out ski touring and whatnot. And then of course, snowpack tests, right? I put this at the end because they get a little overemphasized. Obviously on a, on a six full day course like we do in Canada, we really have time to dive into differences in snowpack tests. What are the limitations? What are their strengths? How to use them over time, looking at weak layers, things like that. And that gives us a really nice six full days to really go out there and we watch the snowpack change over the course of days. If we're very, very lucky, then we get a ton of snow and then we get great skiing in addition to that. That's just kind of an overview of what you get on a level two, those, the new areas and new things we're pushing into uh, to build on those level one skills. So typically folks will do a level one and then we encourage them to tour for a couple seasons or you know, however long to really get a handle on their level one. And then we suggest like, ah, you know, now it's maybe time to think about a level two. And, you know, really it's a completion of that recreational stream. There's the a level one, a companion rescue and a level two. And really we should look at that as kind of a overall course that you do over the course of a few years, right? You know, there's some different ideas about maybe you go to a new snowpack if you're going to do a level two. If you're a Colorado skier, maybe you go up to the Tetons or you go out to Washington or you come up to Canada just so you get a look at a different snowpack and how to really drop into a place and, and get a feel for it so you can go ski in and, and uh, reduce your uncertainty and, and lower your risk a little bit. If you're considering an area too, it's a great next step for most people. Uh, up in Canada, like I said, you know, we spend six days doing it, but the area two itself is actually a three-day course. So it's pretty manageable for most folks to get it done and uh, you take a Friday off from work. There are a few places that'll do it over the course of several days and they break it up so that way you don't have to miss a work day. You know, the reason I started doing them in Canada is just because it gave us such a good opportunity to do a deep dive and really get into the curriculum and, you know, and just have a blast doing it too. Like one of the real drags on avalanche courses is often you don't get to do very much skiing. So when we go up there, we get six uh, full days where we get out tour in between four and seven hours, you know, depending on the weather and the conditions and all that. And it gives us a bunch of time to give some coached application too. So in six days, you really get a chance to be in the front, decide where you want to go ski in, identify what you're feeling like is uncertain for you. Like, Hey, we haven't skied on a North aspect yet. Is that weak layer we're worried about down there? Well, great. We'll go ski somewhere, find a North aspect where we can safely investigate and make some observations, things like that. And then, you know, we're going to have two full uh, mountain guides. So it's myself and Tim Brown. And uh, Tim Brown's an IFMGA mountain guide as well. He's a former forecaster. He's a guide instructor trainer at the AMGA. I mean, he's just a super skilled mountain guide. And he's a really fun dude to be out with. So we'll have two lead guides, but two tail guides as well. So really the ratio is like three to one. So you just get a ton of coached uh, feedback and, you know, some little hints with um snowpack tests and things like that. I'll show you a video of one of my mentors doing a snowpack test here in a sec and giving out some ideas. It gives us time to really apply those skills and get some feedback. And of course, we bring a chef. I showed you Fabian. Fabian's not actually working next year. My buddy Michelle is coming in. She's awesome. She goes touring with us every day. She's fantastic. Like I said, we fly in and out and on a helicopter. And then once we're up there, it's all human powered, but we get the whole place to ourselves, which is pretty sweet. You don't have, uh, you're not battling any other groups for uh, tracks and whatnot. So here is my buddy, Colin. This is the gen I was telling you about who helped uh, mainly really outline the new curriculum. And then I did a, a pass writing on it and then it went to the education committee and whatnot. But Colin's been in the snow for, I think this will be his 43rd winter or something. Phenomenal mountain guide. So here he is demoing a propagation saw test 
you don't know what that is, no stress. It's just a column you can see isolated there. And this one looks like it's about 30 centimeters on that downhill front side and looks like about 120 uphill. And then he drags his saw through the weak layer. So you can see right there, the weak layer is already outlined it a little bit. And he's going to drag his saw through it. You'll hear him. You'll see the saw almost snap a little bit and the whole column will collapse and slide forward a tiny bit. We are recording. Right before he stopped moving the saw, the crack shot off the front of the saw and went all the way across the block. So it's a propagation saw test, right? And as you can see, this is a really, really deep weak layer. So the, the PST is really good at testing deeper weak layers, right? So this would be an appropriate moment where a PST would really, really work, where an ECT would not be recommended for a weak layer that deep. And PST is a great tool for tracking weak layers, just like uh, the ECT and testing them. So you saw that there. So we'll talk about those limitations and strengths and pit craft and how to you know perform those tests. This one's a little longer. It's very important if any of these tests have good and consistent technique. So it's 30 by 90. Yep. So make sure Make sure you cut. So use your saw, even if you're using a ruche block cord, make your, use your saw to put kind of a starter cut for the cord to go into the back of the block. So this is how you keep your block consistent in size all the way down. Okay? So. So you see what I'm doing? I'm actually cutting with my saw. And if you have a lifelink saw, if you have your saw with you, yeah. your yeah, lifelink. Oh no, not the lifelink. You don't have the lifelink. If you have the lifelink one, which is 50 centimeters, even that's the best snow saw out there. It meets in the metal when you do these two little cuts, oh, right. and you can actually isolate the whole thing. So don't throw away your lifelink saw. So now you can see he cuts on each side of the block with the saw and that makes a little channel for your rich block cord to go down. So it's just little tricks like that that'll really improve your, your pit craft and it makes your, um, it makes your uh, data a little more um, accurate and a little more standardized like that. And um, so it just really gives you a leg up on doing some of these snowpack tests. All right, here's another little quickie. This is from Weimar Lodge that first year. I'll show this one. It, when, you, when you cut, and all, one person can cut. You don't need two people. You just need two probes. So there's another little free Colin trick is using two probes. You can see in that background, there's a student's pit right behind Colin. And they had two probes out trying to cut that. Now, in the Kootenays, that often works because you might have a meter 40 of really soft snow to cut down through in Colorado, where you might have sun crust or a wind slab that's like pencil hard for 40 centimeters. Sometimes that trick doesn't work, you know. But um, it's tricks like these Colin will show you that, you know, Tim Brown has that really speed up your pit craft and um and make it pretty slick for you so cool in addition to those um pit techniques and things like this you know we really have time to dive into some of the decision making so we talked about a pre-bias or a mindset that we're using these days that has really filtered in from the canadian the helicopter ski industry and debiasing in the few field areas done a ton of research on uh, debiasing strategies and how to manage cognitive bias and uh avoid using the wrong heuristic at the wrong time and things like that. So it makes it really cool. And then terrain coding is just a fancy way for, you know, to say uh, this go, no go, this terrain sort of selection process we do where we close terrain on certain days and just say, we're not going into there. And maybe we could open it that evening and go the next day, but we, once it's closed for the day, we leave it closed. And that's another element from the Canadian heli ski industry, right? And then we put it all together, how we put our observations you know, avalanches, weather, snowpack into a proper context. And then we identify, hey, do we have uncertainty? Have we, are we missing information? And if we can identify that, can we reduce that uncertainty? How do we address it? And how do we account for it? And then how to track those weak layers over time. And I mentioned this before, seasonal history, a run atlas, and their opening and closing terrain on the day. This is a 
good indication right there of uh, the snowpack they had had rain about well, two weeks before this. So there was a huge ice layer in the snowpack and then they'd had about 70 centimeters of snow. You can see John Maroney skiing it right there. And then there was another 80 centimeters forecast this night. So it sounds really cool, but we were at a backcountry hut in Italy. And so we kind of looked at the snowpack we had, the weather that was coming and said, well, we're going to get stuck at the hut for three days here. And sure enough, they got absolutely pounded. And um, we skied out on this day, got to the car and went over to Verbier where it was like actually sunny and we skied kind of knee deep pow instead of being stuck at the hut in extreme avalanche danger. So, you know, it's just things like that that we try to apply that. But man, it, this was a heartbreaker skiing out to the road because you can see it's trench down right there. The skiing was just absolutely fantastic. This is in Grand Paradiso National Park in Italy. The Chabot hut is right up out of sight on the left. But I think we did the right thing. Otherwise, we would have sat in the hut for two or three days and not skied at all. But that's kind of an overview of uh, the Airy 2 and, and a look at what we do up there at Weimar Lodge. Here's some of those summer resources I mentioned. Bruce Jameson is a gent up in Canada. Some of you may recognize his name from academic papers. He was at ASARC and was one of the developers of the propagation saw test. Dr. Jameson has just updated an ebook called Backcountry Avalanche Awareness. I think you can actually buy it on thepowdercloud.com. That's one place where you can just Google around and look for it. And I think it's only six bucks. It's a great deal. But he's an absolute like snow Jedi. Totally worth it. I just bought it. I haven't looked at it yet. I'll check it out. I got a plane flight coming up. Um, another thing that I found up in Canada was uh, Doug Littmer. Littmer is a longtime avalanche professional. He has an, also an ebook, The Guide's Guide to Save for Travel in the Mountains. And I like that one because it's really interactive. It shows you like snow crystal formation and things like this. It's got an advanced section. It's pretty cool. I thought it was really neat. The book I just wrote that came out last year is called The Ski Guide Manual, and that tries to sort of bleed in some of these mountain guide and uh, avalanche educator techniques that we use and try to share those with uh, the general public and, and aspiring mountain guides and folks like that who, you know, maybe you're just inching into some of those uh, more advanced techniques. Published by Falcon Guides, you can get it at your gear shop, I hope. You can get it at Chauvin Guides or, of course, on Amazon um, or your local bookstore. You know, sort of an overlooked part of the avalanche practice that we all do is we try to, you know, stay fit and uh, get strong. And so I'm really into that book, uh, Training for the Uphill Athlete by Scott Johnson and Killian Jornet. That has been a cool uh, resource for me just in terms of training and Treta. So those are some things to think about over summer. And then hopefully we take it in the next winter and we all get some skiing like that. And that's not at Weimar Lodge. That's actually in the Valley Blanche right behind Chamonix. World's most famous ski run, they say. But uh, that's the kind of ski days we're all hoping to get, I'm sure, next year. Pretty cool. Here's a little more skiing from up in Canada. There you go. So there's some more particulars on the area level two at Weimar Lodge. You can book it through 57 hours. So it's kind of a eight day. It's actually more of like a seven day thing because the first day is a bit of a half day. The last day is a bit of a half day. Those are our exchange days. But then we have six full days of touring in there. So typically we do an hour or two of classroom stuff a day. We you tour plan all together, all that. But then we go touring. If it's phenomenal ski conditions, we'll go huge. You know, if it's really nuking and we're going to have really good ski conditions the next day, well, then maybe we do an extra hour or two of classroom, stay out of the storm, and then uh, we go skiing huge the next day, something like that. But we go touring every single day for four, five, six, seven hours. And I'm doing two of those Airy 2s at Weimar Lodge. So one starts on January 15th, one starts on the 22nd, and those will both run for a week. So as students from the first week fly out on the 22nd, the new students are flying in. So that's going to be a, a lot of moving parts on that day. But, and then the first week of February, we're going to do another one, but based in Nelson. So that's not at Weimar Lodge, but it'll be based in Nelson. And that one I'm still trying to put together because I'm going to try to work a little bit with the Whitewater Ski Area Ski Patrol and get a heli bump that day up to ski on a glacier a little bit. So for those first two Weimar weeks, it's 2850 US a person. And that's everything, the helicopter flight, the guides, the Airy 2 course, the chef, the lodge, all that. As you can see, that January 22nd course is starting to get there, almost sold out, not quite, but then we do 12 students on each week. All the other details are on there. You can find stuff at my website, vetamountainguides.com, V-E-T-T-A. And then a huge thanks to 57 Hours, and thanks, everybody. Keep in touch.
see you guys for another webinar this year, maybe, but certainly next. <laughs>